and welcome to this video tutorial. So this video is all about airbrushing. Um, I just wanted to go through some of the basics, uh, just what I've learned through my experience. Uh, just kind of start from the bottom in this uh, part one of the series. Uh, so there'll be another video after this one, which will go into more of the practical side of airbrushing. So I hope that this video will be helpful for anyone who's kind of thinking of getting an airbrush themselves or has one sitting around at home that they haven't uh, built up the courage to use yet. Um, so yes, so this video I hope will just kind of clarify some of the the things that uh, you might want to know before you start getting into it or you know help kind of clarify things for people who've been airbrushing for a little while but are kind of getting a little bit lost maybe. Uh, yeah, so I just want to start off by showing my personal setup, uh, how I've kind of tailored my workbench to get more comfortable with using my airbrush. All right, so here's everything laid out in front of me. So this isn't exactly how I have my uh, workbench set up while I'm working. Um, I just kind of brought everything into into the shot so we could see uh, what's going on. So I'm just gonna go through and just talk about some of the products and some of the items that I've got in front of me right now. So most important one, the airbrush itself. Um, this hose which is attached to my air, um, air compressor, which is obviously another essential item. Um, I keep a, a palette close by um, with an old brush, um, just for paint mixing. Um, some paper towel for cleaning. I also use these little cotton bud ear cleaner thingies. Uh, they're quite handy for cleaning inside the cup and other parts of the airbrush. Uh, this little jar here, little tin here, that I just use for dumping. Um, I'll go in a bit more into that later. Uh, and the airbrush itself I'll go into a bit more later as well, um, about the specific model and and uh, some of the specific features of the air airbrush itself. So the other things that I like to come in front of me are these bottles here, there's quite a few. Um, so uh, this one, I've just repurposed um, one of the other bottles, the Vallejo bottles. Uh, this is just distilled water, which I should use for cleaning, uh, sometimes for thinning uh, paints or other things that I put through the airbrush. Um, so the reason why I used filtered or distilled water is just to kind of, you know, sometimes tap water can have harsh minerals and things in it, so those and those can can be harmful to the airbrush itself, so yeah, I just I just yeah use distilled water just to play on the safe side. Um, so I use all the the uh, Vallejo products, airbrush cleaner, which is an essential item. Um, and then we've got these two guys, which you mix into your paints. Um, if you're not using pre-mixed paints. Then these guys are, are what you want to be using. Um, I also actually tend to thin down some of the premixed paints already. Uh, I use a lot of the Vallejo ones. Sometimes I find they're a little bit too thick. Um, the Games Workshop Citadel Air paints I find are a bit too thick as well. So these still come in handy for for those. So these are, I would say, these are an essential product. So you, you might be wondering what the difference is between a thinner and a flow flow improver. So the thinner itself thins down the paint. Um, it thins down the viscosity of the paint um, without um, losing adhesion of the paint. Uh, flow Improver helps to delay drying time on the tip of the needle. Uh, so this is, it's actually really, really handy actually because when you get that uh, tip dry, it's just pain in the butt to you know to continue on airbrushing while you're struggling with the paint flow uh, so the flow improver to help prevent that is just yeah it's a real real nice thing to have um, so I actually because I more often than not will add both of those products when I'm thinning down a paint I actually just mix them I've got a, a premix so it's just an equal mix. Um, I just go off what the product says, uh, and honestly, I'm 
I was just kind of reading off what, <laughs> what the bottle says itself. Uh, I mean, if you had these products in front of you, you could read that yourself as well. So they recommend adding one to two drops per 10 drops of paint for both products. Um, so they're the same. They say to add the same amount. So I just mix them together and you don't have to worry about using two different bottles while you're uh, mixing your paints. So then we've also got the paints themselves. So these are, as I mentioned, from the Vallejo range. Um, so yeah, they, I, yeah, more often than not tend to just use them straight from the bottle. Sometimes I like to thin them down a little bit, as I mentioned. Um, yeah, these metallics are really nice as well. Um, if you can get your hands on these, I'd really recommend them because using them straight from the pot with a paintbrush, they have amazing coverage as well, which you wouldn't expect from an airbrush paint, but yeah, they're just really, really nice. So I'm going to clean up a bit and then we're going to focus on talking about the airbrush itself. Actually, the other thing I didn't mention is, <laughs> is a glove. Um, it's kind of not super important, but um, you know, you might not want to get paint on your hands. Um, so yeah, just a little bit of a protection. One of the other things that I'd recommend as well when we're talking about um, protection is one of these guys, a face mask that will filter out, um, you know, harsh chemicals and stuff like that. The Vallejo products and Games Workshop products as well, and you know, most manufacturers will say that they're products are non-toxic but um, yeah, I'd say it's better just to play on the side of caution uh, and just protect yourself when you can um, it's you know you're probably going to be okay breathing in a bit of the, the paint but it's better just to be be safe and uh, look after your lungs <laughs> alrighty so on to the airbrush itself so uh, this is going to be a quite a basic kind of walkthrough of the airbrush um, for those out there who have never picked one up, have never seen one in the flesh, um, or just don't know much at all about airbrushes, uh, and that's fine. So I'm hoping this part of the video will help to kind of clear things up a little bit. So in the airbrush world, there's basically two different types of airbrushes. There's a single action airbrush, and there's a dual action airbrush. So uh, so single action will have the trigger that controls the airflow and the paint flow at the same time. And that functionality is, you know, just for basic painting, uh, doesn't give you a lot of flexibility in, uh, you know, the kind of uh, ways you can apply it. Um, but the dual action, which is um, what this piece is in, in particular, um, you're able to control the airflow by pressing down on the trigger and you're also able to control the paint flow by pulling back on the trigger itself. And you can control those at the same time and to the degree that you pull back the paint flow and the air flow, uh, you know, has a lot of different applications. Okay, so I just wanted to go into talking about some of the basic components of the airbrush. So I didn't want to go into too much detail with this. I just wanted to talk about four components that I feel are most important to talk about when painting. So we've talked about the trigger a little bit already, but I'll go into a bit more detail about that. Um, we've got a nozzle at this end, which is where the needle comes out. Uh, the cup, which is where our paint sits. Uh, and you can see in there the needle itself, which runs down the length of the airbrush. So starting with the nozzle, um, so this is just the standard one that comes with the Iwata Eclipse HPCS. Um, so you can get different sizes with these and it will obviously kind of be a narrower kind of fan on the end of it, which will uh, allow for finer detail work. Uh, as I mentioned, this is just the basic one that came with the airbrush and I find that it just works fine for whatever I use it for. Um, when I go into talking about cleaning in the next video, this is one of the spots where you want to kind of keep your eye on um, 
as you're using it and, and when you're cleaning it uh, because that can cause a lot of the issues with paint flow and airflow um, down this end. So the cup. So this is a gravity fed cup, which is obviously named because uh, gravity feeds it through into the nozzle. So I often will mix the paint there itself. Some people don't recommend doing that. Uh, later on in this video, I want to show you some paint mixing outside of the airbrush. Uh, we'll use the palette for that, uh, just to play on the safe side. Um, the needle itself, which I mentioned runs down the length of the airbrush, uh, that kind of uh, has a relationship with the trigger here. So, as I mentioned, pushing down on the trigger controls airflow. Uh, so, there's not a lot of control in the airflow itself. It kind of just has an off and on setting in, in this airbrush particularly. Uh, I think some higher end airbrushes, you're able to have a little bit more control over the airflow. Um, and then pulling back on the airbrush, as I mentioned, it actually pulls on the needle and that's what allows the paint to flow through towards the nozzle and the air as you apply the air, it sucks the paint out the end of the airbrush. Uh, and obviously, the more you pull it back, the uh, the wider the opening becomes um, in the nozzle and allows more paint through. So I'll go into a bit more detail about the trigger uh, later on and kind of show you how to play around with paint flow and airflow to uh, get the results that you want. All right, so I just wanted to talk about paint thinning uh, and talk about you know some of the paints that are on the market that we can use for airbrushing um, and just go into the importance of getting the right paint consistency to use through an airbrush. Um, just like when you're using a paintbrush and we talk about things like you know, base consistency, layer and glaze consistency, there are different kinds of consistencies that um, you know are appropriate for what you're trying to achieve when using a paintbrush. And it's not too dissimilar with an airbrush. Uh, the kind of rule of thumb for uh, working with an airbrush is that you don't want the paint too thick. Uh, if it's too thick, it's not going to flow through the airbrush properly and you risk uh, things like blockage which can damage the airbrush itself and just cause you a bit of hassle trying to get your paint job done when uh, you, the airbrush is just constantly blocking up and it's not flying properly. So I just wanted to go into talking about uh, yeah, how to achieve a good consistency and then from there talking about uh, the relationship between paint consistency and the air pressure output that you're getting from your air compressor and how those two work together and how we can make those um, work to achieve the best possible result. All right, so I mentioned earlier that I like to use the Vallejo paints. Uh, they come as ready-made, ready-mixed to go straight into the airbrush. Um, obviously in a dropper bottle, it makes it a lot easier to use. Uh, there are the Games Workshop range, Citadel Air, as I mentioned earlier, I find that these are a little bit thicker than the Vallejo ones, a little bit thick for my liking. So I do tend to thin them down a little bit just to um, get a nice flow through the airbrush. Uh, but of course you can use standard paints just with uh, the thinner and flow improver mix applied to them uh, to make them compatible to flow through the airbrush. Uh, and I showed obviously the Vallejo ones and there's no reason why you can't use Citadel ones as well. Citadel paints. So when we're talking about paint mixing, as I mentioned earlier, I think that the safest way to mix the paint is to mix it outside of the airbrush cup to begin with and then to, uh, with whatever way, usually I use a, a brush to um, pick it up and, and apply it into the airbrush cup. Um, the reason why that's safer is because if you start applying 
normal paint into the airbrush and then you know while you're reaching for the the thinner some of that paint can start to set inside the airbrush um, it might not happen every time or all the time but if you're putting normal paint into an airbrush uh, you run the risk of it um, causing a blockage which we want to try and avoid uh, the other thing is it's a lot easier to check the consistency of the paint when it's outside of the cup and we can look at it on a palette like this so the little exercise that I wanted to do was just show you what the consistency of this paint looks like so a lot of people talk about a good consistency for airbrush paint being milky but I mean the way that the Vallejo ones are formulated really doesn't look like milk <laughs> it's I would say it's thicker than milk it's kind of a more of a creamy consistency um, so if you're wanting to use a paint that you don't have in a ready-made airbrush uh, form then my recommendation would be to take your said paint and just mix it in here so and using so I'm just gonna put one drop in for now and this is probably gonna be thinner than that paint over there I'm quite close actually uh, and that way you know that that's gonna be an accurate consistency to go through the airbrush so this is probably actually a little bit thicker so you could maybe put another drop of the thinner into it so that's just you know a basic little exercise to ensure that you are getting a good consistency through the airbrush all right so from paint consistency i want to go on to talking about air pressure and its relationship with paint consistency um, so i hope this doesn't bore you too much but i have put together a little graph that i will illustrate um, live for you and I hope that it will help to make things a little bit make a little bit more sense uh, and then going on from there I'll talk about some of the problems that can occur if we don't uh, create that optimal uh, balance in the relationship between air pressure and the paint consistency and uh, and then troubleshooting those how we can solve those problems all right so I just put together this little line graph um, that I'm going to illustrate over the top of right now um, I just thought it'd be an easy way for me to kind of illustrate uh, what I'm talking about in terms of the, as the title suggests, paint consistency and air pressure relationship. So on the side here, we've got our air pressure, which is coming from our air compressor in PSI. Uh, and then this scale down the bottom here, the paint consistency, no particular unit of measurement, um, just you know, a scale of thinner paint to thicker paint. So the maximum that I kind of PSI that I would ever use would be about 40. I don't know if my air compressor could handle any higher than that, um, but that's fine. Uh, I don't use this for paint. I really only use this for cleaning. And that actually works quite well because that little bit of extra air pressure helps to push a lot of that gunk out uh, that you want to get rid of. Uh, and then just filling in some of the other numbers here, halfways, 20, obviously, zero at the bottom, um, 30, and 10. So, really, a lot of the time, I don't go any lower than 20. Maybe around 15 is probably as low as I would go. 30 PSI is the optimal PSI that I use, uh, and that's for things like uh, base coating and just basic airbrush applications. Uh, so that's, you know, that's the air pressure there, the paint consistency. So on this end here, the thickest that I would go would be, you know, the, the consistency of the premixed Vallejo air paints. Uh, for obvious reasons, I wouldn't go any thicker than that because any other color, any other paints like I mentioned would just be too thick and would cause issues with blockage and stuff like that and just wouldn't get a nice smooth application uh, and then th when I go thinner than this sometimes like I mentioned I tend to add a little bit of thinner 
uh, to the Vallejo paints. Usually when I say that, I'm talking about lighter tone paints, particularly white. I find that sometimes the whites are a little bit too thick. So just getting that little bit of thinner in there and flow improver just helps to just, yeah, get, get a nicer consistency with that. So when we're talking about this relationship, what we're seeing is something that should look like this so that we are I know from trial and error that my 30 psi is good for the Vallejo paint uh, and then if I'm going a little bit thinner I can get away with using a 30 psi but I might drop the psi a little bit uh, and I'm gonna go into later as I mentioned, why I drop the PSI uh, when I'm dropping the, th the thickness of the paint, the consistency of the paint. Um, what you might also find is that you want to drop PSI when you're doing finer detail work. You want that little bit less airflow to give yourself a little bit more control. Um, and because you are dropping the PSI, you want to be dropping your paint consistency as well. Um, if it's too thick, it causes this effect that, um, I don't know if this is a technical term, <laughs> it's just what I like to call it, spattering. And it's where you get, as I'll show later, I'll demonstrate that, where you don't get this nice smooth coat and you get, um, this, yeah, like spattering on the outside of, of your main kind of um, spray. Uh, and it just sound, the sound of it as well, just sounds like the paint is struggling to come through the airbrush. Uh, you will most certainly notice that if you're use, using paint straight from a, a normal paint bottle and instead of the pre-mixed um, airbrush paints. Um, and so the other thing with thinner paints as well is if we're taking the pressure too high, um, and getting into this danger zone here, we start seeing another effect. And again, I don't know if this is the technical term or not, but this is what I like to call it, is spidering. So this also is influenced by the proximity of the airbrush to the surface that you're painting. So the closer you are, the more you're gonna notice something like this. But what you will mostly notice this is if your paint is too thin and your pressure is too high, and what happens is it, again I'll show this later, it'll make more sense, as the paint hits the surface it just kind of gets shot out by the uh, the um, the air and it doesn't create a nice smooth area, it just kind of pushes it out to the, to the sides as you would imagine um, the air pushing it away from you know, where the, the air is localized. So I hope that helps to make a little bit more sense of what I'm talking about. The general rule of thumb is that if your paint's going thicker, you want to take your pressure higher. Um, and hitting the nice happy spot on the on the curve there, um, <laughs> where you're getting a nice smooth paint flow, you're not getting any blockages, you're not getting any of this spattering or spidering happening. These two things we want to avoid. Um, and then on the other end, dropping the pressure a bit when we're wanting to get some finer detail um, where we're wanting to get closer to the surface so that we're creating those nice smooth lines um, whereas you know with with this area here we're just working on things like base coating and stuff like that um, so we can move further away from the surface we want to create a larger cone of coverage um, therefore we want the air pressure to be higher and we, we're working with a thicker paint which is giving us better coverage um, so yeah um, and the other thing that you might see as well um, which is a different it kind of breaks the rules of this graph to be honest when you're working with things like inks um, I like to use inks sometimes to go over uh, you know when I've already done a bit of um, a base coat and then a bit of a highlight on something with an airbrush and then you go over with a nice concentrated ink and it just brings everything together and just brings out that strong vibrance of the paint 
um, which is the, the approach that I took with my um, Horus Heresy Ultramarines, um, that obviously an, an ink is quite a thin paint, but you want to create, create a nice dispersion um, of the paint, uh, of the ink itself. So you want to, like I mentioned, you want to create a nice wide cone and get a nice coverage with it. So it kind of, it does break the rules of this graph, but if you're kind of just doing general airbrushing work, just remember this, that if you're going thicker, you want the pressure higher. It allows the airbrush to push the air through, or the paint through, uh, because it is a bit thicker, it's a bit more stubborn. Uh, but if the paint's a bit thinner, then you want to drop the pressure, because if it's going through too fast, uh, it's just not going to adhere to the surface nicely, it's not going to be nice and smooth and you're going to see the spidering effect. Uh, so yeah, so I hope that helps to make a bit more sense of things. Alright, got the airbrush fired up and now as I mentioned I want to start showing you some of these problems that we can uh, encounter um, if we don't get the right consistency and air pressure. So I'm going to simulate uh, what happens with this spattering effect that I was talking about. So at the moment, what I've got in the airbrush is just the um, black Vallejo air paint, pre-mixed, good consistency, ready to go. But I've got my air pressure set to 15 PSI, which is way too low. Um, so when I start to spray, start getting this hairy kind of not a very nice consistent look. That is what I refer to as the spattering. And you can even hear it as I mentioned earlier. I don't know if you can hear it on the, with the air pressure, air compressor going, but it just sounds like it's struggling to get through the airbrush. All right, so now I've turned the air pressure up to 30. And what I'm starting to see now It's looking a lot smoother. You can see the difference between the two. So this is this is good. This is not good. <laughs> so I can try to avoid that. Uh, all right. Now I want to demonstrate you to you something that's a little bit crazy. I wouldn't recommend this at home. Uh, I've put some of that straight in the cup because I wanted to illustrate to you why uh, what happens. You know, when you haven't got the right consistency, uh, even though the air pressure is still set at 30. Uh, what I'm starting to see, again, I'm going back to that spattering sort of look, aren't I? It's very similar to what I was seeing there. So the solution is not to just put the air pressure up to get it to flow nicer. The solution is to uh, get the right consistency and keep the pressure the same. Um, again, like I mentioned, having that kind of paint in your airbrush is just not good for it. So I'm going to clean that out and then I'm going to show you uh, what I'm talking about when I was talking about spidering. All right, so after giving it a good clean, um, what I'm going to do now is show you some spidering. So what I've done is I've got some of this in there. Just going to put a little more in. What I've done is actually turned the air compressor up to 50 psi. Um, and I'm going to demonstrate how setting the air pressure too high, even though using the right consistency of paint, can get you into trouble. See how that gets interrupted straight away by the air just going haywire on it. Or you get that kind of ruffled sort of look. Yeah, fix up. Not ideal. Um, so, air pressure's too high, not really getting a great result. So now I'm gonna have to go, I'm gonna show you the other cause of this issue, which is if your paint is too thin, but your you, you know, your air pressure might be set at the optimal 30 PSI. All right, so I've thinned that out quite substantially. Um, air compressor set at 30 PSI. Uh, 
and it's happening again. If I get really close, it goes crazy. So that's another issue that you can encounter. So the having the right, you can obviously you can see from this having the right paint consistency for what you're doing. Um, it's very important, um, as I mentioned. It's just like using a paintbrush. You want to make sure you're using the right consistency for what you're doing. Um, so, getting that right, you will avoid a lot of problems going forward. All right. So, I hope that has been helpful uh, in kind of demonstrating to you what I was trying to illustrate with the line graph. You may even want to stop at the point where the line graph is filled out and take a screenshot of it and just have it uh, you know next to your desk or whatever to try and uh, to give yourself a bit of a reminder of it um, but yeah just remember that if your paint's a bit thicker take your pressure a little bit higher uh, if it's too th if it's going a bit thinner then uh, drop your drop your pressure a bit um, and that all depends on what you're trying to achieve um, what part of the, what part of whatever model or whatever you're painting um, yeah so I hope this part of the video has been helpful. In the second part, I'm going to go into more of, uh, you know, practical ways of using airbrush, um, the correct way to paint a surface, um, and then showing you how to do a little bit more fine detail, um, playing around with things like that, and then going into a little bit of taking care of your airbrush. So um, I'll show you my little cleaning procedure that I like to use each time I use my airbrush. Uh, and yeah, just you know, keeping keeping your airbrush nice and clean and tidy is is important. So just yeah, I want to share that with you guys. So yeah, I hope this video has been helpful, and I look forward to showing you the second part as well. So thank you again for your continued support. I really really appreciate it. Um, yeah, so thank you.